Recently, I was shocked to discover something called racism. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever heard anything about this, but it's pretty bad, and I don't think it even has anything to do with racing. In the interests of humanity, I'll be shedding a light on racism, which is the discrimination and prejudice towards people who don't have the same tan as you do. Racism is often considered to be hateful and ignorant, but there's another type of patronizing racism exhibited by otherwise well-meaning simpletons. We have to look after these people because they don't know any better that type of thing. John Howard Griffin might be a good example of this. He decided to bridge the gap in race relations in the 1950s deep south of the United States, which is fair enough, but to do this, he painted himself black in an attempt to live among black people and document his findings, and I'm not so sure about that. You know, I'm pretty sure I saw a similar thing on the Animal Channel, and just wait till you see the foes of this Joker in his disguise. John Howard Griffin was born in 1920 in Dallas, Texas, USA. With a scholarship in music, he went to France to study, but was soon faced with World War II. And if you guys thought racism is bad, wait till you hear what was going on during all of that. At 19 years old, he joined the French Resistance and helped smuggle Jews to safety and freedom in England. Safety and freedom not being two words I'd associate with England, but you'll soon understand this ethnic background stuff is complicated. Griffin returned to America in 1941 to join the army. Air Corps, and he was stationed in the South Pacific as a radio operator. Towards the end of the war, a Japanese bomb blast left him with a severe concussion, which affected his eyesight. By 1946, this had developed into total blindness. Back in Texas, where racial segregation was legal, Griffin noticed that as a blind man, he was limited in his ability to judge people by the color of their skin. He instead had to make judgments based on people's character and intelligence, and realized that by doing this, he couldn't tell who was black and who was white. His blindness had shattered his ideas of race. In 1957, after 11 years of blindness, Griffin's sights inexplicably came back, and even though he was now well equipped to return to a comfortable life of racism, the revelations Griffin had while blind never left him. Two years later, he decided to more fully explore the effect race had on life in the Deep South, where racial tensions were high as the civil rights movement campaigned to end segregation. Sounds like a good guy with admirable intent. He'd go down the path of investigative journalism, sort of. He'd go to New Orleans, pose as a black man, that bit sounds a bit less admirable, and write about his experiences. He asked a dermatologist how best to become black, and for some strange reason the doctor aided him in this. Now, I generally avoid rendering skin colour in these videos, or really any colour at all, but for this one guy, I'll make an exception, because the story is about changing the colour of his skin. The doctor had Griffin spend 15 hours a day under a sun lamp, for a week, something I'm pretty sure a doctor would strongly advise against today, and took drugs used for the treatment of vitiligo to darken his skin. Any splotches of skin that weren't quite dark enough, Griffin would paint over with dark skin creams. Aside from the fact he was essentially doing blackface, which is widely considered a bad look for white people, he must have been doing some serious damage to his skin with all this shite. How in God's name did a dermatologist approve of all of this? After shaving his head to hide his straight hair and seeing his newfound blackness in the mirror, Griffin wrote a fierce, bald, very dark ne- I'll just skip that word for the sake of YouTube- glared at me from the glass. I had expected to see myself disguised, but this was something else. I was imprisoned in the flesh of an utter stranger, an unsympathetic one with whom I had no kinship. I looked into the mirror and saw reflected nothing of the white John Griffin's past. No, the reflections led back to Africa, back to the shanty and the ghetto, back to the fruitless struggles against the mark of blackness. This is kind of what I'm talking about with the patronizing stuff. It's like his heart is in the right place, but he's a little misguided. You're not Martin Luther King, you just painted yourself black. This becomes even more galling when you see what he actually looked like. He looks white as hell, even with his artificially darkened skin, this guy is obviously white. I mean, the pictures are in black and white, and you'd sooner say this is a white guy in purple makeup than you'd say it's a black fella. Look at this guy in the back, he's like the caucasity of this man. If there's a single black person in the world who'd be fooled by this, his name is Stevie Wonder. 
Maybe. For six weeks, John Griffin lived as a black man, meaning he could only stay at Black Oni hotels, eat at Black Oni cafes, and use the bathroom in Black Oni washrooms, which according to him were surprisingly difficult to find. Keep in mind, he was breaking the law in doing this. As a white man, it was illegal for him to enter these businesses and use these facilities, but apparently his disguise worked, or at least for racist white people who couldn't get past the dark skin color to see this man was so white, his name could have been White. Whitey Snowborn. Yes indeed, Griffin noticed his poor treatment at the hands of his own people. He had a hard time applying for jobs and was often met with rudeness when doing something as simple as buying a bus ticket. On the bus, he was expected to give up his seat for white people and he often heard racial slurs being directed his way. But according to Griffin, the hate stare was the most prevalent thing. Even people who didn't voice their hatred made it known in the way they just looked at him. Now, Griffin noted not every white person was racist towards him, some were friendly and helpful, but overall he described living as a black man as a personal nightmare. He couldn't even write to his wife because the observing self saw the ne uh, right darling to a white woman. The chains of my blackness would not allow me to go on, which is a bit much considering he was not actually black and at any time he could have just gone back to being white which is what he did after six weeks. In 1961, Griffin wrote a book about his experiences called Black Like Me, which became a massive success and even had a film made about it. On one hand, it was praised for giving the plight of black people a white voice, which would be more readily heard by white audiences. While on the other hand, it was critiqued for essentially being a white man presuming to speak for black people. And also the whole blackface thing was a little offensive. But if Griffin thought people hated him before writing the book, he was about to discover the Deep South didn't much care for his charade. Upon returning to Texas, Griffin was greeted by an effigy of himself being hung. Hate mail and death threats followed. Griffin ran off with his family to Mexico for nine months for safety. Knowing this guy, he probably donned a fake mustache and sombrero to learn about the local people. Hey, fuck the gringos. Hey, viva la raza. Puta, puta. He returned to America to continue writing and giving talks about race relations and social justice. He was still a divisive figure, however, and he found himself being followed by cops and targeted by the KKK. In 1964, he claims to have been standing by the side of the road with a flat tire when a group of men approached, assumedly to help. Instead, they dragged Griffin away from his car and brutally beat him with chains and left him for dead. It took him five months to recover. By 1980, John Griffin had lived to see an end to segregation and the South electing black mayors, congressmen and sheriffs. He died that same year of heart failure at the age of 60. I'm surprised it wasn't skin cancer that got him after all that time under the sun lamps. So what do you think of John Howard Griffin? His goal was righteous, but his method was perhaps a bit questionable. It definitely wouldn't fly today, but that's just how times change. The same type of people who wanted him dead back then probably wouldn't care today, and the same people who praised him would probably now burn him at the stake, or at least write an angry tweet about it. Well, if you like this video, I have plenty more where I talk about people of every colour and creed with an air of smug superiority, a hallmark of my generation, I've been told, from people who have presumably never dealt with anyone from literally any other generation. I make a new video every week, so if you'd like to see them, you can subscribe. Well, until next time, stay racist and end safe. Wait, no. End racist and stay... Well, no. The racism. Ugh, just stay safe. The chains of my blackness would not allow me to go on. I wish they'd put Prince Namor on the tube. Hold on, I think I have to puke.